Good morning from Stanford University. My name is Will Chu. And together with Itwe, we are delighted to welcome you to the fall quarter of the Storage X International Symposium. Today, we have a very interesting technical deep dive into a very timely topic, which is the development of lithium metal negative electrode for the next generation battery technologies. And to get us started on this topic, we have invited two academic authorities on the topic, Professor Ju Lee from MIT and Jason Zhang from PNNL. So let me get started first uh, by inviting Ju to the stage. Terrific. So Ju is a professor of nuclear science and engineering and also material science engineering at MIT. Uh, he's actually our counterpart at MIT where he leads the energy storage effort uh, in the MIT Energy Initiative. So it's a good gathering of people today. And uh, a Jew uh, has done so many things. Um, if you go to the website, uh, you can find his very diverse interest. Uh, he's an experimentalist, but he's also a computational material scientist. Uh, he works on almost anything that involves atoms and has made very outstanding contribution to the battery field. I think, uh, Ju, I've never told you this, uh, one of your early work in the battery field actually got me started in the battery field myself. Uh, in 2010 or 2009, I think 12 years ago, <clears throat> Ju published a seminal paper showing the in situ T a movie of a tin oxide nanowire undergoing battery cycling. It was the first of many papers that uses uh, TEM to understand dynamics. So when I first read, read that paper, I said, wow, this is exactly what we should be doing. And 12 years later, there are so many interesting applications of in situ observations of battery dynamics. So Ju helped kickstart that particular effort. So that was a very inspirational and seminal work. Ju has received many awards. Uh, notably, uh, he has received the highest honor in the US for an academic, which is uh, in, for early career academics, which is the presidential um, award from the White House. He's also a fellow of the Materials Research Society. He has received um, the MRS Outstanding Young Investigator Award, um, the TR35 um, uh, Outstanding Investigator Award from Technology Review at MIT. He is a fellow of uh, AAAS as well. So there are too many awards to list. So without further ado, let me ask you to get started and he will tell you about uh, lithium metal. Ju, please go ahead. Thank you for that very nice introduction. And uh, well, uh, it's really great pleasure and honor to uh, uh, start uh, this uh, semester's uh, uh, storage access symposium. So uh, I'd like to talk about the topic actually uh, that uh, both uh, Will and uh, E3 have done a lot of work and I took great inspirations uh, from. Uh, and I took a little bit peculiar title, lithium metal engine. And just want to say that, uh, you know, for solid state battery, there are three uh, well-known problems. One is uh, you've got to maintain uh, contact, so ionic electronic contact. And so that's the reason uh, generally there is a few megapascal uh, of stack pressure. And then there is an issue of fracture. And from the Nernst equation, we know the lithium metal, each atom has this much volume and that converts to for every 130 millivolt over potential, uh, if not relieved, uh, then you can accumulate uh, up to a gigapascal of pressure if you have a, a little surface flaw here. Uh, so lithium ion comes to the solid electrolyte and it's plated here, but it needs volume. And so you have to squeeze the lithium back out. Otherwise this kind of stress uh, could accumulate, but you know, uh, generally the solid electrolyte uh, is, it, it could be a brittle material. And the last problem is uh, electrochemical corrosion. And if we look at the electrochemical splitting window uh, of well-known uh, solid electrolyte like LGPS, LZO, et cetera, uh, they are very uh, usually not so stable at very reductive voltages. And furthermore, uh, this uh, very nice work from uh, Gerd Zeter's group is uh, only on the bulk material. So if we have grain boundaries, 
then they would actually have distinct uh, electrochemical stable window from the bulk phase, and they could be selectively reduced. And so generally, two and three give you stress corrosion cracking problem. And this is a very nice uh, recent work by uh, Professor Mengu uh, from China. And you're looking at a crumbled solid electrolyte husk. So this uh, was actually uh, formed in ether-based liquid electrolyte. Uh, but what happens is if you take the lithium out, you see that you know, this SEI, which is an ad hoc solid electro shell, uh, basically it, it, it crumbles. And so there's clearly kind of mechanics issues uh, going on uh, in, uh, in, in this in metal. So I took this somewhat uh, strange title because our goal of doing battery research is basically to defeat this beast, right? This is an internal combustion engine that uses fossil fuels. And the working fluid of engine uh, is, is air in this case. And so uh, a provocative idea is when we deal with this in metal or alloy, uh, the working fluid, so to speak, uh, could be uh, you know, the engine of, of the solid state battery. Now, just to sort of illustrate what I mean, this is an experiment where people took gold at room temperature. Uh, they made a so-called mechanical brake junction, they tear it apart, <clears throat> and then they just leave it uh, in air for uh, four months. And gold is you know, air stable, but then what they see is that the profile retracted by something like 20 nanometers uh, over a period of four months. And what we have done uh, is <clears throat> to show that this can also happen for sub 10 nanometer silver. So this is just uh, four nanometer silver nanoparticles. And it shows this kind of liquid-like plasticity, even though at any time uh, it still maintains a crystalline diffraction pattern. And uh, at room temperature, you know, uh, it's really uh, the homologous temperature, which is normalized by the melting temperature, is pretty low for gold and silver. So if they can manifest some kind of quasi-liquid-like behavior, the question is, you know, what can happen for lithium? Uh, room temperature is actually 66 percent, two thirds of the melting point, bulk melting point of lithium. And so about eight years ago, uh, in collaboration with Zhi Weishan and so at all, we have looked at uh, actually another material, tin, with, with a, a you know, pretty similar melting point to lithium. And this shows that uh, when we tear a tin ligament, the final stage looks like a liquid a meniscus. Uh, you get this almost liquid-like feeling. And in fact, when we really zoom in, this is a diamond punch, there's some carbon here. But when we push this uh, thing uh, inward, there is a displacive plasticity. But when it recovers, you see this very smooth, gentle uh, recovery, which is driven by diffusion and not by dislocation motion. So uh, in 2013, uh, we have discussed this uh, size dependent deformation mechanism. And so generally, you know, uh, we have this smaller, stronger trend for uh, dislocation plasticity. So uh, the prediction is as you reduce the ligament size or grain size, uh, the stress would actually go up uh, in the whole patch relation where uh, this is actually minus uh, one half power. But what we have uh, observed and, and uh, said in that paper is once your uh, size is below about 100 nanometer, then you would trigger this Sokobo creep uh, with a very different uh, exponent. So instead of you know, minus one half, the exponent is actually plus a third. So uh, we predicted that uh, smaller uh, will not be stronger, but will be much, much weaker. Uh, it's a very dramatic uh, weakening trend. And this was later verified also in intermediate temperature materials like aluminum. So in this case, uh, what we are doing is actually have a heated substrate uh, at 400 C and so the reduced temperature is from 70% to 50% for copper. And with a cold tip, we can draw the metal wire uh, across uh, you know, several microns and, and even in, in silver as well. So when we look at this uh, deformation mechanism map that's developed by uh, Ashby and Frost, 
what you generally have is the horizontal axis is this reduced temperature where you have T over T melt. And for lithium, uh, uh, we're saying it's uh, actually uh, in this region. And then the stress is the uh, deviatoric shear stress normalized by the shear modulus. So uh, lithium have a shear modulus of three gigapascal. So uh, this would be three megapascal, and this would be about one atmosphere. Okay. So the question is, you know, can we drive lithium metal motion with less than one atmosphere kind of uh, pressure difference and give some kind of a creep like behavior, so called a liquid like behavior, even though it is still at the bulk melting temperature is, is still uh, above uh, the current temperature. So uh, let's say that you know that's a possibility. But then the second question is, you know, what can you use to contain uh, lithium metal if uh, you know it's a working fluid? Because it's a very corrosive fluid, as we know, uh, it corrodes uh, pretty much all the our you know favorable solid electrolyte. And it also, you know, even though we hope the stress is small, the stress, as I'm going to show, can reach tens of, of megapascals. So we have to design for like 100 megapascal stress in the lithium uh, liquid uh, or, or solid uh, working fluid. And so uh, in this review uh, with the Professor Su Lin Zhang, uh, we basically say that, uh, you know, because you have a limited choice of good uh, high conductivity solid electrolytes, which are absolutely stable against lithium metal at zero volt, uh, we have to think about other kinds of solids. And, and this actually, I want to say uh, at outset is not a new idea. Actually, people have been doing this, uh, uh, Professor Yisui have been doing this for at least five years uh, before you know, we, we, we think about this even. But we're just sort of categorizing uh, this, uh, this behavior. So generally, if you have a solid, which uh, is an electron insulator, but a lithium ion conductor, then that is in this quadrant. If uh, you do not conduct lithium ion or any ion, uh, but you conduct free electrons, then you have metal. And generally, we know that solid state battery, you generally have to have a you know, metal current collector, you're working with lithium metal, and you've got to have a solid electrolyte separator. But then uh, there is another possibility, which is uh, you can have something which conduct both electron and lithium ion. And uh, this will be a mixed ionic electronic conductor. And you can work with this to build your solid state battery. And there is even a fourth category, which is an electron insulator and also uh, does not conduct lithium ion. So we call that Eli material. And so the point uh, of uh, what we initially tried to propose uh, in, in, the, in, in the previous paper is to say that uh, there are not that many good solid electrolytes, uh, which are absolutely stable against lithium metal, but there are actually many, many mix which are absolutely stable. So they'll have no problem uh, when you put it side by side with body center cubic lithium metal at zero volt. Uh, and they can even have electronic conductivity and some kind of ionic conductivity. In fact, uh, the rule is that if you take a ternary phase diagram or quaternary phase diagram, all the terminal end member phases with a direct flight to lithium BCC phase uh, will be absolutely stable. There will be no side reactions, no SEI in naked contact uh, with lithium metal, where of course any other compounds without a direct tie line, they would uh, actually decompose into, uh, into, into these phases. So uh, we all know Professor John good enough. So my uh, ex postdoc, uh, uh, Yu Ming Chen, when he was working in John's group, uh, developed this uh, electro spinning method where he can make uh, this kind of carbon hollow tubules uh, with an inner diameter of about, of about 100 nanometers and a wall thickness of 10 nanometers. And we're just thinking. Is it possible to first lithiate this uh, to the terminal phase and then uh, guide, use this as a rail to guide the motion 
uh, of, of lithium metal and what is the nature of that motion. And so uh, what uh, we have shown is that um, if on this side you have a solid electrolyte and on that side you have metal, we can actually have lithium plating and stripping uh, all within this tubule across a distance of 10 micron uh, for 100 cycles. Now lithium has a very low Z, so you don't see a very strong contrast, but you probably can still see something we're actually fast forwarding the movie. Uh, and this can happen uh, like an engine piston uh, for 100 cycles without any damage. And when we play with kind of normal speed, and in this case it's stripping, we see something very peculiar, which is we see actually this kind of faceting, uh, which indicate to us that actually what's moving inside uh, is uh, a single crystal. Now, of course, uh, in all these in-situ TM studies, you always worry about uh, electron beam damage. So in the case of the TIN uh, example, we have uh, systematic studied electron beam damage and found that was uh, insignificant. Uh, so what we have found uh, in the case of lithium is, first of all, we did see the body center cubic uh, lattice parameter uh, fringes. And number two is that uh, in a control experiment uh, for lithium metal, which is outside of the tubule, uh, with uh, this kind of uh, beam current, uh, it would turn amorphous from crystalline to amorphous uh, in 86 seconds. But uh, for the uh, crystal that's encapsulated in the carbon hollow tubule, uh, it will stay crystalline for 20 minutes. So the, uh, if inside it actually protects the, the lithium metal. And when we vary the voltage, uh, this is the very first half cycle where we lithiate this carbon hollow tubule. And then uh, once we over it, we can have uh, this void volume start to take up uh, lithium metal, and then we can have this piston-like motion, and generally uh, the plating and stripping over potential that we can measure is on the order of 100 milli electron volt. But of course that includes uh, all the other losses in the system, and not necessarily reflecting uh, the local over potential, because if it really is 100, then we are going to have like a gigapascal local stress, Right, which, which is pretty challenging for the material. So the general idea is that uh, if we can use a beehive of meek, uh, then uh, a benefit is we can always keep uh, the lithium metal in electronic and ionic contact. Then we will not have this dead lithium problem where you know, it loses a contact with the current collector and with ionic percolation paths. So this, will be uh, maintaining the percolation. And also uh, uh, because of the reserved space, then uh, we would relieve the stress. And then there is no need uh, for uh, a few, you know, tens of atmosphere uh, pressure, uh, stack pressure to maintain the contact. And lastly is that if we use the absolute thermodynamic stable mix, then they might be, uh, you know, uh, completely inert when in naked contact, uh, if let's say there is some um, sliding motion, then we wouldn't have SCI or SCI debris. Now, later uh, after the work uh, from Samsung, uh, we have realized that it's also possible to have this inverted configuration. That is, uh, if you induce the lithium metal nucleation uh, by let's say silver, uh, which actually you have beautifully shown a few years ago, uh, as well as using a room temperature coarsening, then the lithium metal can be lured away from the solid electrolyte side and can be mostly stored on the current collector side. And so that's actually the more desirable configuration. And then we use this big phase to coarsen uh, the, 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 the lithium phase away. And I also want to say that uh, this meek surface can also be the site for the charge transfer reaction because you can have a reduced, uh, let's say uh, a lithium ion meeting an electron in the meek and have a reduced lithium add atom. And this lithium add atom is not a BCC phase and it can do the surface diffusion and, and it can coarsen uh, the BCC phase. So this can actually be part of the charge transfer reaction. 
So let's look at some numbers. Uh, the first question is, what kind of stress are we talking about to have a decent strain rate? Because if you look at the classic uh, deformation mechanism map, uh, these contours are uh, creep strain rates. And you have a very low strain rate, something like 10 to the minus 10 per second. And you use a very low stress uh, if you plug in the numbers, uh, but this is not something we can use, okay? And so if that's the case, then we have to go to higher stress, in which case uh, we're going to have a hybrid diffusive uh, displacive process where you're going to have dislocation glide and dislocation climb, which are controlled by uh, boundary or uh, bulk diffusion. Uh, and that uh, would be you know, more stressful to the surrounding structures. So that's a possibility too. Uh, however, uh, what we noted was that uh, this diagram was for a coarse grained nickel. So that was for a, a 0.1 millimeter uh, grain size nickel. And uh, Professor Kobo uh, have derived uh, this uh, creep strain rate to be inversely proportional to the third power of the grain size. And so if we can reduce uh, the grain size or you know, the characteristic size by three decades from 100 micron to 0.1 micron, which is 100 nanometers, uh, then uh, this instead of 10 to the minus 10 would be 10 to the minus one per second. And that would be serviceable, right? Uh, for battery, because that just says, you know, you can extend by 100% in 10 seconds and, and that could be useful. And so we plug in the numbers, uh, we can have power law creep uh, in the bulk lithium metal. We can have bulk uh, Navarro herring creep uh, uh, also in the bulk lithium metal. We could have diffusion in this meek BCC interface, which is only two angstroms, uh, this incoherent interface, or we can have lithium ion and electron transport in the mixed ionic electronic conductor, which is 10 nanometers. So uh, all these pathways are, are possible. Now, what we have asserted is that uh, you do not need a dislocation creep uh, if your diameter is 100 nanometers. And the reason we see this is that if this side is a solid electrolyte, uh, and then we are stripping lithium, uh, then this region is a uh, vacuum. And so there's no way you can have dislocation power law creep here. Uh, and all the lithium must be sucked through the meek or for, by surface diffusion to the solid electrolyte. And so it shows that it's not uh, absolutely necessary to have sliding in the system. And another thing we have seen is uh, very often these tubules uh, have obstacles inside. It's not fully smooth, but we see that uh, this lithium can actually climb over obstacles as long as they're not fully closed. Uh, and so that again seems to suggest that there is a strong uh, liquid-like diffusive flavor uh, to it. And when we plug in the numbers uh, for the bulk concentration, for the bulk uh, diffusivity, uh, both in the beta phase, the BCC phase, as well as in the bulk meek phase, as well as for the interfacial diffusion, also for the surface diffusion. Now, we don't actually know the interfacial diffusivity uh, at that time. We can model it, but we didn't quite know for sure. So we made this actually uh, probably a bit optimistic optim um, uh, approximation, which is to say the interfacial diffusivity is similar to the surface diffusivity and then use uh, a universal surface diffusivity formula that in the previous works we have validated ourselves uh, and other people have used this. Uh, and then we basically come to the conclusion that you can, once uh, this uh, pore size is 100 nanometer, you can have a interfacial diffusion dominant transport mechanism that overwhelms the bulk meek diffusivity. And that's a pretty uh, liberating fact because that means that uh, basically all mix uh, could work. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, because we don't rely on the bulk diffusivity, we just rely on this interfacial diffusivity. And if it's lithophilic, uh, then 
it has a chance to be a, a good enough channel. And so from the transport, we have a design criteria, which is, okay, let's say we want to have uh, three milliampere per centimeter square of current density, as well as uh, you know, three milliampere hour per centimeter square of capacity. Now this would require us to have a, uh, a depth of 15 to 20 microns to uh, you know, make room for the, for the BCC phase. And then we don't want to have a local over potential exceeding, let's say, uh, 15 millivolt because that's going to over pressurize our working fluid. So that's going to force us to have a uh, effective uh, lithium uh, diffusivity of uh, 200 milli siemens per centimeter square. And then we have certain porosity. So we plug in the numbers and, and see that these generally uh, can uh, satisfy uh, this kind of reasonable engineering requirement uh, to make a bulk cell. So that was uh, in our paper. Now, uh, there is also an issue of mechanical robustness because uh, we initially just intuitively uh, hypothesized that you cannot just have you know, few layer graphene as this, as, as this meek because it's too easy to crumble. Uh, so we need something, uh, something like 10 nanometers to have, and also this honeycomb geometry to have some kind of uh, stiffness uh, in compression and in tension. And one reason is, you know, in bulk, you know, in real manufacturing, we're not gonna have real vacuum, so we're gonna have some kind of inert vapor in here. And because this is like a piston, it's going to compress the vapor, maybe by a factor of 10. And so we're going to have megapascal level of pressure inside. And also, you know, generally people may like to have some stack pressure. Uh, and so, so generally, uh, you know, you need some mechanical rigidity uh, to, to this open porous uh, nanostructure. And I will talk about this later. So, uh, after our work is published, there is this tremendous work uh, from Samsung, uh, which used a uh, nanoporous carbon silver interlayer. And so that qualifies as uh, a meek interlayer because silver would form uh, intermetallic compound with lithium and carbon is, is also a meek. And it regulated the deposition of DC metal on the bottom. Now this still requires a, a stack pressure. Uh, and also uh, there is very nice work from uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Ye Ming Chen, uh, ingenious idea of using sodium potassium uh, eutectic liquid uh, as an interlayer. So both uh, in the, both cases, uh, these are mixed ionic electronic conductors. They conduct electron and lithium atom, if you will, and they would uh, relieve the stress. Uh, you know, this is liquid, this is open nanoporous and maintaining contact. So I do think that uh, in the, you know, uh, solid state battery, you will use uh, this mix. There is an issue of, if you use the solid mix, how you're going to anchor it firmly in the solid electrolyte. Uh, there is a, what, I, what we call a slippery footing problem. Because if the meek conduct electrons, right, and the solid electrolyte conduct lithium ion, then they could uh, nucleate a BCC phase here if they can overcome the interfacial adhesion. And uh, uh, you could have this basically an interfacial crack, uh, a wedge that's formed here. And then because this is very soft, uh, you know, this could be pulled out uh, of the socket. And so that is a problem. And so uh, in our design, uh, we figured you may need to use uh, this last type of solid medium, which is an electron and lithium ion insulator, and it's completely inert. And it just serves a mechanical binder to the solid electrolyte and to the meek. Uh, and it just holds the meek interface uh, in place. Uh, and so, uh, in real, you know, engineering structures, you can never have perfect alignment. So what if your solid electrolyte is taller than the uh, Eli binder? Uh, then in that case, uh, you could enucleate this lithium BCC beta phase here, 
and it's going to grow, it's going to push out the solid electrolyte. It's like a, a gingivitis, you know, it's like a gum disease, but then it's going to come to the root and hopefully it's going to stop there. That adhesion crack hopefully should be stopped if this Eli SC interface is lysophobic enough and strong enough. And so this Eli is kind of like this insulators that you use to build you know, our high voltage grid. You know, most of this, of course, is metal to transmit electrons, but without these insulators, you know, it's not going to work, right? So you could also have a case where the solid electrolyte is lower than the meek. So in that case, uh, you know, you couldn't nucleate the beta phase and you need something like a spark plug <laughs> using the engine analog. Or, you know, you could have some initial shorting between the meek and the solid electrolyte. So you would uh, nucleate uh, the beta phase here. And then once you have this, uh, then uh, you can keep going because then uh, in all the other places, uh, whenever you have the beta and the solid electrolyte interface, that, uh, you know, you can nucleate a new beta phase. And by the way, uh, uh, you know, one reason that you could have the beta phase on the current collector side is that we have seen when you strip, uh, you are taking lithium first from here. So even though initially, even though you are not nucleating here, gradually it could migrate later to this side because you're always stripping from this side and, and the battery uh, can still work. And we have uh, utilized the materials project uh, to uh, search for Eli candidates. And so uh, it turns out that there are these uh, pens of compounds with band gap greater than three electron volt and have no lithium. And furthermore, uh, they're not afraid of lithium. For example, when you put the beryllium oxide side by side with uh, lithium metal, lithium metal turns out is not able to draw up beryllium oxide of its oxygen. So that's pretty uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, so, so you can have these as, as binders. And in our effort, initial effort to scale up, uh, we have made uh, all kinds of uh, this kind of uh, nanoporous, open pore structures. Uh, we have tried anodized alumina, using it as a template to make carbonaceous uh, structures, which are, are you know, few centimeter by few centimeter by tens of microns deep. Uh, we have also used microfabrication to make this silicon mesh. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Uh, one is because it's too coarse, but also that upon lysiation is like a shock, uh, it crumbles uh, and, and not really robust. But eventually uh, we are successful in making uh, these uh, carbonaceous open nanopore structures, uh, which are reasonably robust. And also uh, with uh, inorganic ceramic type uh, and actually very robust uh, meek uh, uh, structures. And uh, in collaboration with Samsung, uh, now there is actually a big advance in, in making this kind of open pores uh, structures. And I'm not going to bore you with uh, the details of the scale up uh, effort, just to say that uh, the TEM work, uh, you know, showed that, that, you know, we can have the alkali metal grow or strip uh, in channels as a single crystal. And if it's, uh, you know, below 100 nanometers and, you know, 20 microns in length. So that actually has a pretty long aspect ratio. It's like a gun battle. It's like an aspect ratio of 200. And you can actually have this kind of large area meek beehives, uh, which you do not need any stack pressure and can cycle up to 200 cycles, uh, like the Samsung colleague have shown, with a very significant uh, capacity like five milliampere hour per centimeter square. You can maintain constant uh, ionic electronic contact so you never have dead lithium. And also uh, there is no uh, SEI uh, in most of the contact areas. Uh, and so there is no SEI and so uh, there is no debris forming and the reserve stress, uh, reserve space can relieve the stress. And then finally, uh, we're still working on this, which is how do you have a good interface with the solid electrolyte? And in the last sort of two or three minutes, I just want to come back to this mechanical issue, uh, which is um, if you look at, uh, you know, 
search this word cavitation damage in pumps, uh, it turns out that even water can damage uh, stainless steels like this, can cause all this kind of cavitations when you subject the working fluid to tension. So we actually have a hypothesis, uh, which is that the reason uh, that people need a stack pressure of a few megapascal is to keep the lithium always uh, under hydrostatic compression, or at least it's below the cavitation stress of the working fluid. Like we said, you know, a lot of time, you know, when you do the deposition, so when the uh, over potential is negative, you would generate, let's say, one millivolt would generate 4.7.4 4 megapascal of hydrostatic compression. But I think people paid less attention to stripping because when you apply a plus one millivolt, then you can generate a tension of 7.4 megapascal. Like when you pull uh, you know, a syringe, you can have cavitation in the liquid. This turned out to be a problem for trees. In fact, this may limit how the tree uh, can grow, how tall it can grow. The tallest tree is in you know, the beautiful redwood tree in California is 100 meters. And you're going to have, when you come to the top by capillarity, uh, plus one megapascal tension in the sap of the tree, xylem. And so there are actually biologists who study uh, liquid water cavitation in trees, and they say that usually the trees are exempt from cavitation unless there is extreme drought or when the sap freezes. And so what they show here is like 20 different trees, but when they have a 50% loss of conductance. I find that very interesting because, you know, they also use the word conductance. And it turns out that, you know, this P50 about, you know, minus five or five megapascal tension is when a lot of the trees would die uh, because their xylem would, uh, would actually, uh, you know, fracture like this. And so if we plug in, you know, some elementary calculations of the surface tension for lithium, 0.4 joule per meter squared. Now, if we have a nanostructure diameter of 100 nanometers, then just this surface tension can create a tensile stress of 16 megapascal uh, just from the Young Laplace equation. Uh, you know, if this is zero, then inside you're going to have a tension uh, of 16 megapascal. And people have seen that bulk water would cavitate at 20 megapascals. It's going to nucleate, you know, bubbles inside overcoming the surface energy. Uh, and then because, uh, you know, bulk lithium metal is about uh, 10 gigapascal bulk modulus, so we roughly estimate that the cavitation tension for lithium metal could be 100 megapascal, provided, uh, you know, that your solid structure can even survive uh, that stress. And we have evidence, and this is uh, in collaboration with Professor Huo Xin, that uh, uh, generally the solid structure is going to crumble uh, at that kind of stress. So what he showed was that during stripping, uh, there is a critical uh, wall thickness. Now, this is an ad hoc solid electrolyte with lithium oxide. Uh, and what he found was that there is a critical Wall thickness to diameter uh, to a radius ratio uh, above which uh, is not going to cavitate. It's the, the cylinder is going to stay its original shape, below which uh, is going to crumble like this. And also shown previously in the cryo TM, showing uh, that crumbled uh, SEI layer. And from this, we actually can infer an SEI, a solid electrolyte, strength of about 300 megapascal from this experimental study. And so uh, just to end the, the talk is, is the idea is that, okay, we're going to uh, build, uh, in, I mean, at least in this approach, without any stack pressure, a solid structure made out of uh, the current collector, the solid electrolyte, but maybe a lot of meek and a lot of, I mean, and, and some uh, sealing agents like this Eli material, to have a room temperature lithium metal engine uh, with you know, lithium metal in and out. Uh, and the goal, of course, is to defeat this beast, uh, which is you know, burning fossil fuels. Uh, so uh, with that, I'd like to uh, stop here and uh, 
I'll answer any questions you may have. Ju, thank you for the fascinating talk. Um, let's take a few moments um, to answer some questions. So Ju, maybe I'll start with my own question first. So you really highlighted the importance of interfacial transport um, or surface transport uh, in the mixed ionic and electronic conductor. So do you think at the end of the day, it is possible even not to use a bulk mixed ionic electronic conductor and simply rely on the surface for ionic transport? In other words, what is the relationship between surface ionic conductivity and the bulk ionic conductivity in, in these systems you are studying? Exactly. So uh, in fact, those uh, calculations uh, we have put in the papers uh, was actually trying to propose that. Uh, in fact, uh, that liberates the choice of the uh, bulk meek. And all you need is uh, some lethal felicity. So the interfacial transport and wetting with lithium metal. You could have a monolayer, uh, of lithium that wets the, the surface, that becomes the key. And there is also a geometry design uh, in this because it doesn't have to be 100 nanometers, it could be uh, 20 nanometers, as long as it's not a closed pore, so it's open pores. And in some sense, we're proposing some kind of uh, mesoscopic, quote unquote, artificial graphite, uh, where, you know, instead of, uh, uh, the atomic you know, graphite layers where you intercalate lithium atom, we have these channels, long channels, where you can intercalate, intercalate uh, uh, this second phase, which is the beta phase, by exactly uh, what you said, uh, this interfacial transport. Uh, right, Drew, so I think this is very liberating uh, because then essentially the, the backbone can just mainly be responsible for conducting electrons in the bulk as opposed to also lithium. And in terms of the transport mechanism for surface uh, diffusion, uh, I think you have implied it is more of a atomic species rather than ionized uh, lithium. Is, that, um, is my understanding correct? It can be both. So you can have uh, an electronic transference number and uh, ion ionic transference number. Now, when the P you know, goes to the electronic dominance and you're more like a metal. And then when you go to uh, lower to zero, that'd be more like a solid electrolyte. And you can actually have a gradient structure. So you can, uh, by tuning the transference number, you can actually have a uh, lithium ion. Let's say if you pick a standard solid electrolyte and you cut a surface, you can have lithium ion you know, surface diffusion. That'd be mostly ionic. But then as you go towards more towards the current collector side, and then the, you can tune the electronic transference number. At some point, that lithium ion will meet an electron and gets become a lithium atom. And so you can have your charge transfer reaction right on that uh, gradient region when you turn from ionic to uh, electronic. Right, so maybe just a further question on this. Um, so you described the, the, the conversion of lithium ion to lithium by the ratio of ionic versus electronic transport, right? So you have the two meeting and that's where the electrochemical reaction happens. No, uh, I was actually more- I want to, I want to stop here. Uh, I want to say that there are two things. There is the neutral lithium atom uh, and there is also the BCC phase. So I want to separate these two concepts. So the uh, lithium ion to a lithium at atom uh, is, 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 is the charge transfer reaction. But then that charge transfer, uh, that add atom can still diffuse uh, many microns and, and get to a BCC phase. Uh, so there is that distinction here. Right, I guess the, the more fundamental question I'm asking is, what is the surface diffusivity of a adsorbed lithium ion versus an adsorbed um, add atom for lithium? Uh, on, atom, on most of these mixed conductors. Yeah, atom typically is faster. So if you take a random material, if it's lithophilic, mm -hmm. then, then the atom typically is faster. Although I think it's unknown, you know, our favorite, uh, well, okay, our favorite solid electrolyte, like lithium fluoride, the surface, you know, we have a lithium saturated surface, what kind of lithium diffusivity 
is that? So it's, it's, it's actually unknown and unexplored. So that's a great uh, actually research question. Great, and let me just ask uh, a few questions from the audience. Um, so how, um, how much versatility does this approach have with respect to the type of solid electrolytes used? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I think uh, in my view, we may not actually end up with just a single solid electrolyte. As you see in Gert Zader's chart, you know, there are some like LLZO which are relatively stable on the low voltage side. So we may actually have, have two layers uh, of solid electrolyte. But uh, I would say that uh, in, in, in our paradigm, because we are taking the stress away from the solid electrolyte, uh, because we don't even want to have the beta phase near the solid electrolyte. Uh, and, then, uh, and then if there is any motion, if there is any slippage we're trying to uh, minimize, it's more with the meek layer, then I think that does reduce the, the, the chemomechanical stress, that does reduce the stress corrosion cracking uh, on the solid electrolyte. So uh, I think this, this does help. Uh, in other words. Terrific, Jim. One last question from the audience. Um, so you talked about interfacial transport, and uh, this question concerns the interfacial adhesion as the, and as the lithium metal grows within the cavity. So can you briefly also comment on the adhesion aspect in addition yeah. to the transport aspect? Yeah, so uh, uh, even very basic things like a graphite, uh, there are some people who say it's lithophilic, some people who say it's lithophobic. So we have a, a paper recently that uh, discussed, you know, this is very dependent on the partial pressure of the atmosphere and how you do the experiment. There's a lot of contact line hysteresis. It's a, it's a, it's a great question because usually the uh, surface is dirty and, and you really need to have a reducing in, in enough environment to uh, really show the true uh, lithophilicity. And, and there is actually a lot of room for engineering. You could have a MIG, just like Will said, uh, which transmit momentum, so it's stress bearing. It also transport electrons, but then on the surface, you could have a coating, just a very thin coating, which is lithophilic. And you have the desired uh, surface chemistry, which conduct uh, the lithium ion and, and also facilitate uh, this charge transfer reaction. And so there you, can, you can do a lot of surface engineering uh, and nano engineering on, on these meek uh, structures, which I think uh, Professor Yi Cui already have done in a lot of uh, his previous works. He's just not putting, you know, in, in, in this type of uh, theory language. It is a very versatile platform, Ju. Very, very interesting. Maybe in the interest of the time, there are many more questions, um, but maybe we can uh, uh, switch to Yi, who will introduce our second speaker. Let me, uh, well, uh, do a uh, very exciting talk. Let me uh, invite uh, Jason to the uh, stage. Uh, let me introduce Jason Zhang. Uh, Jason is a longtime good friend. Uh, he's very well known in the battery field, particularly for uh, his development of uh, electrolyte for lithium sulfur batteries, for lithium metal anodes. And uh, he has pioneered uh, many concepts. Uh, so I learned quite a bit over the years with Jason, either through his paper or through the interaction with him. Um, now, uh, Jason is a PNNL lab fellow, a very prestigious title right there. And through the Battery 500 Consortium, Jason and I and certainly others have been working together quite a bit. Uh, today is uh, absolutely a great honor to have Jason to uh, tell us about uh, his work uh, related to lithium metal batteries, particularly from the electrolyte uh, design standpoint. Uh, Jason, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this is uh, uh, Jason Zhang. And, um, First of all, I would like to thank Professor Yi Cui and uh, uh, VO2 uh, to invite me to give this uh, uh, presentation, to have this opportunity. Uh, today, I would like to, uh, uh, a few, I mean, early this morning, the Professor uh, Zhu Liu uh, has already uh, given you a, a very good introduction 
uh, on their work uh, for this metal anode, especially uh, using uh, microscope studies, simulation, and also um, some source data uh, studies. Um, I would like to discuss the least metal problem, uh, least metal anode from another angle, mainly from the liquid electrolyte, non aqueous electrolyte. So you may have a more complete view uh, on the performance of the metal anode uh, in, uh, uh, in this field. Uh, here is uh, the outline of my talk. First, uh, I will give a short introduction about the opportunities and the challenges on this metal anode. Uh, then we are go uh, to discuss uh, lithium bandit prevention and uh, determination of uh, lithium cooling efficiency. Uh, third part is on, uh, I will focus on high efficiency electrolyte for lithium metal anode and uh, lithium metal batteries. Um, the fourth part is uh, a quick overview of other approaches to improve performance of lithium metal anode. Uh, and last is a short summary. Uh, Here is a slice we prepared uh, uh, years ago on advantage and uh, changes for this metal anode. So for this metal anode is uh, one of the material which has the highest theoretical specific capacity and the lowest um, uh, reduction potential. Uh, it also has a, a very low density. In combination, it's one of the best or ideal anode for uh, rechargeable batteries, uh, which can lead to more than 500 watt hour per kilogram at cell level, which is also the target and uh, for this metal, uh, for this for battery 500 project. Uh, in fact, this is uh, a 500, uh, this uh, 500 watt hour per kilogram. Uh, uh, this density is uh, first uh, indicated by uh, Professor Stan Winningham uh, in his uh, uh, one of the review paper in 2014. Uh, on the other hand, there are many challenges for this metal anode. First change is uh, the these the this uh, uh, SEM image showing here is what uh, uh, Stan Winningham, Professor Stan Winningham and his colleagues uh, obtained in 1970s when he, they first worked on the lithium metal anode. They found this kind of uh, dendritic growth and which eventually lead to a uh, very serious safety problem. And everyone uh, tend to lithium ion battery since the 1990s. Uh, with advance uh, for new technology, new uh, electrolyte, I think uh, in this uh, 10 years, uh, more and more people start to look in at uh, this metal anode again, try to find, use new technology to find a solution for uh, this metal anode problem, uh, to, to resolve this problem. So uh, to make, to enable this metal anode work, uh, we have to, uh, it's very often to uh, address one aspect of the problem, but to make it, uh, to enable this metal uh, battery to work, uh, we have to resolve many problems at the same time. For example, we have to have a cooling efficiency uh, of this metal for larger than 9.9 .9, ideally. And uh, this uh, electrolyte also need to be stable with high uh, voltage cathode. And uh, the need for a uh, large cell operation, we need to operate at a lean electrolyte, thin each metal and uh, high current density. And last, we have to address the safety problem and sweating of this metal anode. Among all of these uh, uh, challenges, uh, based on uh, literature review and also our parents, we find that um, Electrolyte is the most uh, critical parameter to enable stable operation of lithium metal anode and lithium metal batteries. 
Uh, one of the reasons is uh, uh, other components of the batteries have been used in lithium ion batteries and uh, most time like uh, high voltage cathode, AMC and other cathode uh, is well known and uh, has already has a lot of work. So here is uh, the uh, overview of uh, PNL's uh, uh, work uh, during the last uh, 10 years. Uh, we start from uh, this all uh, my work on electrolyte. Uh, about 10 years ago, when we start to work on uh, to address this metal anode problem, uh, we first uh, start from a baseline electrolyte uh, used for lithium ion batteries. Uh, first problem we want to address is uh, uh, dendrite growth, because that's why, where uh, we uh, everyone stopped on. Uh, most people stopped on uh, lithium uh, metal battery uh, 30 years ago. So we screened um, many different kind of solvent and salt, uh, also the actives. Uh, later on, we find that um, uh, when we use uh, one more of lithium PF6 in properly carbonate, we can get most uh, complete coverage of uh, copper substrate when we in a uh, uh, lithium copper cell. Uh, however, we still get a, a clear dendrite growth even in the best uh, conditions when we use carbonate electrolyte. So the next step is uh, we want to use um, uh, some active. So we develop uh, this uh, cesium based active, which can lead to no dendrite growth. However, the cooling efficiency of this electrolyte, uh, cooling efficiency of lithium metal uh, in this electrolyte is still only about 76%. Therefore, we switch to, uh, we move to other. Uh, electrolyte component. Uh, we, for example, uh, we use an ECPC combination and uh, with actives, we can get smooth lithium deposition uh, and uh, increase cooling efficiency to 97%. Uh, we also further develop this uh, uh, dual salt electrolyte, uh, which can also get a stable setting of uh, lithium. Uh, with high voltage AMC and the uh, cooling efficiency is about 91%. Uh, at that time, uh, we start, uh, we note that uh, um, uh, the uh, Japanese group, uh, they are working on high concrete electrolyte for graphite based lithium ion batteries and uh, uh, get pretty good result. So we developed this uh, high concentrated electrolyte. We try to use that one for a lithium metal battery. Uh, the mine electrolyte we use is a four more for lithium FSI in DME. Uh, use this electrolyte, we can get a high cooling efficiency of uh, more than 99%. Uh, this is the first time the, we can get uh, in the future, um, this metal can be cycled at a cooling efficiency uh, much better than 99%. So later we also uh, uh, develop some other electrolyte, uh, further improve the cooling efficiency to 99.5%. Uh, one problem with high concentration electrolyte is uh, it's high viscosity and uh, uh, high cost. So to address this problem, uh, we further developed uh, uh, a new electrolyte, a series of new electrolytes we call localized high concentration electrolyte. And with this new electrolyte, we not only can uh, get high cooling efficiency, but also uh, it, it is also stable at high voltage cathode. And uh, uh, later, we also uh, replace uh, solvent by no flammable uh, solvent and uh, get similar cooling efficiency. So that's the my uh, roadmap uh, in PNL on the development of uh, new electrolyte um, during the last for lithium metal anode. Uh, 
during the last 10 years. So here I want to give you a, a, a quick overview on one of our early work on surprise leasing dendrite. Um, for this uh, uh, approach, we try to identify some uh, uh, electrolyte attitude. Uh, our thought is um, uh, when we deposit lithium and uh, control uh, reduction potential, we, uh, we pass lithium through the lithium copper cell and the uh, lithium will be deposited at minus 3.04 volts. On the other hand, if we can identify uh, another active which has a, a reduction potential even lower than lithium, then the, this active may accumulate on the surface of lithium dendrite. When this uh, uh, the active is uh, accumulated to a certain degree, they will prevent lithium uh, further deposition of lithium. So the principle we base is uh, according to this uh, Nurse equation. Nurse equation included two parts. First part is a uh, baseline, the standard reduction potential at one more. But it's also included the second part, which depend on the concentration of the active different component. For example, if we use uh, uh, one more of lithium, uh, uh, lithium salt, it will be reduced at minus 3.04 volts. On the other hand, although cesium has a reduction potential slightly higher than lithium, lithium ion, uh, but if we use uh, a much lower concentration, for example, uh, 0.05 more uh, for cesium active, the reduction potential can be reduced to below those of lithium. As a result, when we do the lithium deposition, if we look at the figure on the left side, at first, uh, if we look at the fig figure B, uh, at first, lithium will deposit and form a small uh, fluctuation because the fluctu and, uh, all the electrochemical cells will have some fluctuation. They will deposit into a small dendrite. And the figure C shows this dendrite grows. Uh, lithium, if we control the uh, electrical chemical reduction potential uh, below minus 3.04 volts, but above, uh, I mean, if we control the uh, reduction potential below 3.026, uh, uh, below minus 3.04 volts, lithium will deposit. But if this potential is above uh, minus 3.103 volts, cesium will not be deposited. This is just showing in figure C and D. Eventually, if we can look at the figure, figure E, uh, when the dendrite grows to a certain degree, the cesium IQ will be continue accumulate and they form a um, electrostatic shell. When this shell is strong enough, the incoming lithium ions will be repelled to deposit it in the valley region of lithium deposition. Eventually, the lithium deposition will be smoothed out and uh, this process will be repeated. Lithium deposition using different electrolytes. The figure A shows the lithium de uh, deposition without active. And the figure B, C, D is a deposition with increasing amount of lithium uh, uh, system active. As we can see, the uh, this uh, lithium deposition become more smooth uh, with increasing amount of the uh, active. Uh, very interesting, we also find that uh, if we use high resolution um, SEM, uh, we look at the surface and the cross section, we can see that the lithium deposition uh, is a kind of the nanorod. rod. The diameter of the nano rod is about 200 to 300 nanometer. Uh, they like uh, a grass, they all grow together. So in the microscopic point of view, it's very smooth. Uh, although use this approach, we can get a very high 
uh, a very smooth definition. However, uh, when we measure cooling efficiency, we find that uh, the cooling efficiency of this material, uh, this electrolyte, can only lead to a lithium uh, cooling efficiency of uh, about 76%. I think this is uh, maybe related to uh, high surface area of uh, this definition, as we can show in this cross section uh, image. So here, uh, I want to mention another work uh, we did uh, during the last uh, five years. Uh, that's how to determine the lithium cooling efficiency. Because uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, during our work, uh, we have to screen a lot of electrolyte and uh, uh, solvent salt and additives. Um, but what we, what we noticed that is um, when we measure cooling efficiency, if we use a different kind of density and uh, or we use a different uh, amount of lithium deposit during the process, um, the cooling efficiency measured will be different. So we need to identify a good protocol so we can measure cooling efficiency reliably and repeatedly. So in the figure on the left side, we show the cooling efficiency we measured under the using the same electrolyte. Um, but we deposit, we cycle lithium using different amount of uh, lithium from 0.5 milliamp hour per square centimeter to 6 milliamp hour per square centimeter. What we find is uh, if we use a uh, um, low current dense, a low capacity from like uh, 0.5 milliamp hour per square centimeter, we need to more than 15 cycles to stabilize cooling efficiency. On the other hand, if we cycle sample use higher capacity uh, to, to measure cooling efficiency, in the first uh, a few cycles, we can get a, a, we, the cooling efficiency measured will be stabilized. Uh, next result is um, uh, if we increase we, the, the capacity we use uh, during lithium cooling efficiency measurement, is larger than three milliamp hour per square meter, the measured cooling efficiency will be stabilized. So based on this knowledge, we proposed a new protocol uh, to measure cooling efficiency. Uh, in fact, this uh, initial proposal is uh, uh, proposed by uh, Doran Albach. Uh, he in the 1990s, when he measured cooling efficiency of lithium metal, he found that um, um, there are some surface layer like uh, carbon oxide on the copper substrate. Then he tried to deposit certain amount of uh, lithium, then fully strip it, uh, deposit a larger amount of lithium that only strip part of that for lithium metal uh, for cooling fish measurement. Uh, however, at the end of this uh, measurement process, we still have to strip of lithium. Uh, in other words, the effect of the set reaction between lithium and the copper still there and will be included in the calculation of lithium cooling efficiency and will affect the accuracy. So what we propose is uh, add one more step. Uh, we do, do an initial definition, deposit five million power per square centimeter of lithium. Uh, the reason is uh, we want to be larger than three million power. Uh, we know, based on previous slides, is the copper substrate will be stabilized. Then we fully strip uh, all the lithium. All the lithium. In this case, uh, we believe the copper substrate has already been fully uh, as passivated. Then we start to deposit another five million power. Um, per square meter of lithium, then strip only part of that. The specific protocol can be seen in the figure B, which shows current, and figure C, which shows the uh, voltage profile. Use this profile, we find that uh, we can uh, measure cooling efficiency much more reliably. So it's done depend on person, done depend on how do we treat a substrate. So in our further work, we also find that uh, uh, protocol not only uh, is important, 
in determination of lithium cooling efficiency, but also the, the, uh, important in the uh, second stability of uh, uh, lithium metal batteries, and also it may include uh, uh, anode-free lithium battery. Uh, on the top, we show a few figures. Uh, first figure, figure A, is a, a typical lithium ion battery. We have used a thick graphite anode. For these metal batteries, the thickness is uh, much less, uh, less than half of the thickness of uh, uh, graphite can be used. Uh, for anode-free batteries, we can eliminate the uh, lithium metal anode. And uh, if the cooling efficiency of lithium cycling is uh, high enough, uh, the lithium metal can be removed and we still get a reasonable uh, cycle stability. The figure uh, showing in the bottom is uh, what we get from a copper lithium ion, uh, lithium ion phosphate uh, cell. Uh, if we use uh, uh, low the solid curve, cycle curve is when we use a uh, uh, low deposition, lithium deposition, and the high rate of uh, lithium stripping. Uh, at 100 cycle, we can get a cooling efficiency of 99.8%. But at a low current density, um, if we use a low current density for both uh, lithium plating and stripping, we can only get a cooling efficiency of 98.8%. So this is a, a clear indication that um, the cycling protocol uh, is also important for uh, stability of lithium metal batteries and also the anode free lithium metal batteries. So in next slides, we are show our work on high efficiency electric for lithium metal batteries. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we have done a lot of work um, use a conventional carbonate based electrolyte. For example, one more of lithium PF6 in PC uh, with or without active. Uh, what we find is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we get uh, 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 this dendritic growth. Uh, sometimes, if we include uh, active, cesium active, we can get uh, um, no dendritic growth. Um, but cooling efficiency is still low. So the, on the right side, we find that um, we show the uh, lithium deposition use a high concentration electrolyte. For this high concentration electrolyte, we get this uh, uh, large natural growth of lithium, which has a much smaller surface area. Uh, this much smaller surface area not only reduce the uh, 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 will largely reduce the uh, lithium loss during cycling. On the right side, we show this lithium cycling for more than 1,000 cycles. This cooling efficiency uh, is still larger than 98%. At the low current density, the cooling efficiency can be 99.1%. For high concentration electrolyte, uh, we still have uh, some problem. For example, like high cost, we have to use uh, Four times, four times, four times, four to five times of uh, lithium salt. We also have a high viscosity result as a result of high concentration. So we try to design a new electrolyte uh, which can retain all the advantage of high concentration electrolyte, but reduce, uh, try to avoid the problem with uh, high concentration electrolyte. Our idea is uh, first, we need to find a base solvent. Uh, which can have a high solubility of lithium salt. So the base solvent we use is uh, uh, either DME or DMC. And uh, they have a high solubility of lithium salt. And uh, for salt, we find that the lithium FSI is uh, most stable with lithium metal anode. So most important part is uh, uh, the part C. So to avoid high concentration problem, we add this uh, uh, dilute, uh, such as BTFE and or TTE or other uh, dilute. The most unique feature of this dilute we selected is uh, they have a 
very limited solubility of even salt, but they can still fully miscible with base solvent. As a result, uh, from microscopic point of view, it's a uniform mixture of the uh, electrolyte. But if we look at, if we have an eye to look at the, uh, put on a little metal, what they can see uh, when we apply an electric field, the lithium will only move around the cluster of lithium uh, salt dissolved in uh, base solvent. And uh, this lithium metal is blind to the uh, addition of uh, this uh, dilute. As a result, we can retain all the advantage of uh, high country electrolyte, but we get low cost and low, low viscosity. Also reduce, uh, uh, also slightly increase the uh, conductivity. So the figure on the right side is uh, all uh, uh, proposed mechanism. We have uh, several way to uh, we use a theoretical simulation and other approach to prove this point. Uh, on the figure on the left side is a uh, calculation of flow manager for a uh, low concentration electrolyte. At low concentration, the solvent like DMC has a, a loom under lower than salt. Therefore, when we add an electric field, the solvent will be decomposed first to form a, a organic rich SEL layer, which is not stable with lithium metal. On the other hand, if we use high concentration electrolyte, uh, the loom under of this salt will be shift to the lower uh, loom energy. Therefore, the, this salt will be decomposed first during this deposition, and uh, which will form a inorganic rich acid layer and uh, can largely increase the cooling efficiency of lithium cycle. On the other hand, if we use this uh, uh, on the figure on the right side, we show the simulation uh, calculation of loom energy for this localized high concentration electrolyte. In this electrolyte, we find that uh, uh, salt will still be decomposed first. Therefore, uh, in this localized high concentration electrolyte, uh, salt will be decomposed for first and form a stable SEL layer. Uh, we also calculate the, the radiation distribution. Therefore, we calculate the distance between DMC and the lithium salt, which is less than two angstrom. On the other hand, the distance in atomic level, the distance between uh, BTFE and uh, uh, lithium FSI is uh, more than is about five angstrom. In other words, the salt is closely bonded with uh, uh, a base solvent and uh, push away the dilute. We also use a Raman spectra to show that. Uh, addition of this uh, uh, dilute does not significantly shift the original uh, uh, salt and the DMC bonding, therefore does not affect their base structure. With this kind of fun fundamental knowledge, uh, we did an uh, extensive study on the electrochemical property of different uh, uh, localized high concentration electrolyte. Uh, first one is um, uh, first uh, uh, localized high concentration electrolyte we studied is uh, based on carbonate. Uh, we use DMC as base solvent. Uh, from SEM picture, we can show, see that uh, we can get large lithium deposition. From cross section, we can see the lithium deposition is uh, uh, much denser than uh, when we use baseline electrolyte. And we also get more than 700 cycles at a high current density of two milliampere per square centimeter. In addition to uh, DMC, which is a carbonate-based base electrolyte base solvent, uh, we also look at the other uh, base solvent, uh, especially the ESA-based base solvent. One of the uh, solvent we find that work best is uh, TTE-based. Uh, here we use uh, 1.2 more of uh, lithium FSI in DME. TT uh, electrolyte. And the cell is stable uh, up to 4.5 volts. 
at uh, uh, the cooling efficiency can be uh, up to 99.3 percent. And also this uh, uh, SEM image also indicates that it's very stable and uh, this deposition is uh, very dense. So another uh, optimization of uh, our electric is we try to identify alternative dilute um, because our original BKFE solvent uh, dilute uh, we use is a BKFE, which has a, a low bonding point about uh, 63 uh, centi centi degree centigrade. Uh, of course, this kind of the uh, dilute uh, will not be stable at higher uh, operating temperature. So we are looking for alternative for uh, BKFE. We find that uh, one of uh, alternative is uh, KFEO. Uh, this fermented also format uh, has a boiling point of uh, about 130 degrees C. Uh, we work with uh, uh, the Professor Yi Chi's group in Stanford, and uh, they help us to use uh, uh, this cryo uh, EM. The initial microscope to measure the uh, number structure of uh, SEM layer <coughs> deposited on uh, lithium surface. On figure B, we see that a uh, uh, very uniform deposition of uh, SEM layer formed on lithium uh, metal uh, nanorod. rod. On figure C, we show that uh, uh, this SEM layer is about 10 nanometer. It's very uniform, and also it's uh, one thing surprised us is uh, uh, this SEM layer is monolithic instead of the uh, multifacet or multi-layer structure. It's also uh, amorphous. This is the first reported uh, uh, SEM layer with this kind of monolithic solid electrode interface. With this kind of the uh, uh, very unique unique and uh, stable SEM layer, uh, we get a cooling efficiency of up to 99.5%. And uh, the electrolyte will also lead to very, uh, very good charge discharge rate capability. So in next slide, we show uh, our work use uh, non flammable uh, localized high concentration electrolyte. Here we replace the DMC uh, by a non flammable uh, solvent PEP. And uh, as we show in the figure uh, on the right side, it's an uh, optical image. Uh, figure A is uh, when we use uh, uh, lithium PF6 uh, in a baseline solvent, in carbon solvent. It's uh, very easy to burn. Uh, on the right side, we show the, uh, the flammability of this uh, uh, PEP-based uh, uh, electrolyte. Uh, it's very poor. And uh, basically, we can use uh, uh, PP as a mine solvent. Uh, we know that uh, PP has been used in uh, 2000, uh, or early 2000 by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kang Xu of Army Research Lab. Uh, at that time, uh, they found that the TP can uh, lead to exfoliation of graphite. Uh, although it's a good uh, solvent to surprise uh, the flammability of electrolyte, but we can only use a, a small amount, uh, normally less than 10%. Here, uh, with this metal, we don't have problem with uh, uh, graphite exfoliation. Therefore, we can use uh, TP as the main solvent. And this electrolyte also can lead to very stable cycle, uh, more than 600 cycles. Uh, in next step, uh, after we uh, find this uh, look, the idea or concept of localized high concentration electrolyte uh, can lead to very good cooling efficiency and the stable setting, we try to optimize different component. For example, we try to uh, we select we fix the the dilute at TTE, try to compare different the base solvent. Um, our investigation in, indicates that um, when we use uh, TTE, uh, uh, we, when we use DME uh, based uh, 
as the baseline solvent, uh, we get the best cooling efficiency of 99.5% and uh, lead to very good cycle stability. Another component we uh, optimized is a uh, uh, dilute. Here, we try to fix the uh, baseline solvent. It's, uh, we use uh, uh, DME as base solvent. Then we choose five different kinds of uh, uh, dilute. Uh, from a cooling efficiency point of view, we find that uh, uh, TFEO based uh, uh, electrolyte can lead to best cycle. Uh, on the other hand, when we use TTE based uh, uh, electrolyte, uh, its uh, cooling efficiency is uh, very close. Um, on the, uh, another concern is uh, uh, when we use this electrolyte for port cell. The, we also, this electrolyte also need to have a low viscosity and also uh, can operate at the lean electrolyte conditions. So uh, from coin cell point of view, uh, TFEO based electrolyte is the best, but when we compare uh, use in the port cell, we find uh, that um, TT based electrolyte is still the best uh, when we combine all the properties required. So here's what the uh, uh, Professor Jun Liu, the director for our Battery 500 project, uh, they reported in this year's uh, uh, review meeting. And uh, during the last five years, uh, we work on uh, these metal batteries using different electrolyte. And uh, at first, when we use carbonated electrolyte, the battery can only operate for about 10 seconds. So in uh, 2017, when we switch to our localized high concentration electrolyte, we get um, uh, more than 50 seconds. Then with improved improvement on the electrolyte, the cooling efficiency continue to increase. But the only if we only rely on the uh, improvement in the electrolyte, it's still not enough. Uh, our port cell team, led by um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jie Xiao and, uh, his, and her team, um, did significant work and try to optimize all the process, the match between anode cathode, and uh, uh, try to optimize all the ratio and the other components in the uh, port cell. So, uh, by the combination of all this uh, effort, uh, right now we can get more than um, uh, 600 cycles with close to 80% capacity retention. And uh, we are continue to uh, improve this uh, uh, performance. And uh, we believe in the next five years, we can reach our goal for 500. Um, we can more close to our go for 500 watt hour per kilogram. So here, um, I also want to uh, uh, mention that uh, in addition to uh, localized like high concentration electrolyte, we direct, developed in PNL. There are also significant, significant work in this field uh, on uh, new electrolyte and the coatings. Uh, in this figure, we summarize the Cooling efficiency of uh, uh, lithium copper cell uh, measured using different electrolyte by many other groups. This is a comparison of a different electrolyte. The best cooling efficiency uh, reported is 99.8% uh, reported by uh, Professor uh, Trinchen Wang's group in uh, University of Maryland. Um, this is obtained by the optimized electrolyte and the optimized substrate. Uh, here, I, I also want to mention uh, several other efforts. In addition to the electrolyte effort, there are also other uh, approach uh, should be used uh, to improve the performance of lithium metal anode. Uh, from Paul, the Professor East Chase group in Stanford, uh, during the uh, recent years, they developed all kinds of, uh, uh, several different kinds of uh, lithium hosts, uh, including the, uh, this graphene-based uh, 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 scarfing folding and uh, 
also the encapsulation of uh, uh, lithium. And Professor uh, uh, Zhe Bao and the E3 group uh, developed many kind of uh, lithium coating, uh, coating on the lithium uh, substrate. Uh, this is uh, just an uh, uh, example. And uh, Professor uh, Jun Liu and also uh, Chao Jiang Liu uh, of PNL, they developed this uh, kind of the uh, self smoothing direct uh, anode uh, by functionize the carbon film, then the um, combine the lithium and uh, copper um, in the weighted uh, functionalized carbon film, which can also lead to very high cooling efficiency deposition. So another approach is uh, uh, proposed by the professor uh, Shirley Meng, uh, and they propose this kind of the uh, idea lithium deposition scheme. So if we control the uh, pressure, ideally we should get the, the Ideally, we want to get the deposition scheme like uh, shown in figure C. And uh, in this kind of the uh, non rod, rod structure, we will get a very smooth deposition um, without um, dead lithium. Uh, so the, another method which leads to the best cool efficiency is uh, proposed by, uh, is reported by Professor Chen Cheng Wang. Uh, on the top line, on the right side, top line is the deposition of lithium in a lithium, lithium phobic cup foil, which can lead to uh, growth, significant growth of lithium dendrite. On the other hand, uh, he tried to coat this uh, copper substrate uh, by a uh, combination of graphite and the bismuth. Uh, in this case, they form a lithium, uh, lithium phobic uh, layer on. Uh, copper substrate. And uh, uh, with uh, on the other hand, in the bottom is uh, lithium phytic. So lithium will form a uniform distribution of uh, uh, nucleation on the copper substrate. On the other hand, they also choose a uh, uh, high efficiency electrolyte, which will form a uh, uh, lithium flower rich and uh, lithium phobic ICI layer. So in other words, in the bottom is lithium phobic, in the top is lithium phobic. By combination of these two physical property of uh, materials, uh, they can get lithium density growth and with very high cooling efficiency up to 99.83%. So here's a summary of my presentation. Uh, lithium metal anode is the ideal anode for the next generation of high energy uh, density batteries. Um, and uh, among all the parameters we can control, uh, we believe the electrolyte is most important factors uh, determine the uh, performance of lithium metal anode. And uh, localized high concentration electrolyte and other fluorinated electrolyte are highly effective uh, in lead to high efficiency uh, lithium metal anode. And with uh, our new electrolyte and uh, uh, optimize the uh, cell structure. Um, Pinel has uh, 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 demonstrated the uh, high capacity port cell uh, with uh, more than 350 watt hour per kilogram and uh, more than 600 cycles uh, with about 80% capacity retention. Uh, at last, I want to mention that uh, to further improve the performance uh, of lithium metal anode and lithium metal uh, batteries, uh, we need to combine uh, good electrolyte and all other uh, operating and preparation procedures, procedures and uh, to further improve uh, performance and get an uh, even higher uh, cycle life. Uh, and last, I would like to thank uh, DOE's Battery 500 program for support and thank our PNL team members uh, especially uh, uh, Dr. Wu Xu, Xia Cao, uh, and many other uh, collaborators. Uh, thank you to 500 um, PIs and team members. Uh, thank you uh, for your attention. Jason, thank you for the uh, very exciting talk. Uh, really great data uh, from uh, your lab and also uh, some from Battery 500 Consortium. Um, let me start by asking the first question. 
Uh, I really like the idea of uh, localized high concentration electrolyte. You have been uh, leading the development in these areas. Um, so, and you show the table comparing, uh, you know, the advancement of uh, uh, putting in, you know, different component right there. Uh, so what's still really needed for localized high concentration electrolyte to go to the next level? So what are the things you are looking into? I think you touched upon during your talk uh, a little bit. So I want it to be maybe more clear to the uh, audience. Uh, very good question. <clears throat> Uh, what we found is um, once we uh, get the uh, electrolyte which can enable a cool efficiency of more than 99%, it's uh, uh, many other parameters uh, are less effective. Uh, right now, even increase uh, 0.1% of cool efficiency is uh, very difficult. It's very difficult. And uh, uh, first, element is uh, still continue to optimize uh, uh, baseline solvent and uh, uh, especially baseline solvent. Because uh, as you can see, the, uh, the main advantage of uh, uh, localized high concentration electrolyte come from con high concentration, uh, which directly related to lithium salt and base solvent. So right now we are continue to optimize uh, uh, base solvent, and uh, we have some new result will be reported uh, uh, later. And uh, with uh, alternative uh, uh, base solvent, we can uh, increase uh, cooling efficiency by another 0.1%. Uh, but eventually, if we want to further improve the cooling efficiency, we need to uh, uh, combine all kinds of the parameters. Uh, for example, we need to control the uh, temperature, control the pressure, uh, control the uh, testing protocol. If every component, um, including uh, material selection and the operating parameters, uh, if one of these can increase upon 1%, uh, then that's uh, very significant. So what I mean is uh, we, we do need to combine all the parameters uh, to further improve the performance. So if I look at 99% colonic efficiency now, so what uh, that 1% loss, the detailed analysis of that could be important. I mean, looking at the path of the advancement of colonic efficiency, when you have 80% columbic efficiency, you, got, you have a lot of dead lithium loss. When you get to 95%, the dead lithium loss becomes less. It becomes SCI formation. And then when you get to 99%, of course, every bit of loss, whether it's SCI or a little bit of dead lithium, all contribute. So um, any insight uh, about 99%, what's still the loss right there? SCI, of course, always has the loss. Um, and whether the dead lithium, Jason, still having a little bit. So what, what's your thought on that? I think that to stabilize, to get a high cooling efficiency, uh, uh, first, the most important thing is uh, to get a high uh, uh, stable SCI layer. And I think that's uh, where the new electrolyte, uh, including uh, our localized high concrete electrolyte and other, uh, group develop different kind of uh, uh, highly fluorinated electrolyte. That's the uh, first step to get a, a high, a very stable SEL layer. But uh, after that, uh, once we get a, a good uh, SEL layer, the stability of this SEL layer under extreme, under operating conditions, uh, such as a, a high current density and uh, also a, a different temperature, different pressure, they all affect stability of SEL layer. So during the cycling, we the lithium had to uh, deposit and strip, and the volume of lithium continue to change. During this process, uh, part of the SEL layer 
will be damaged. So that, that's why I said uh, uh, the electorate itself can only do so much. If we want to further improve 0.1%, 0.2%, we need to find some way to control the process and uh, prevent damage of uh, SELR due to operating. Yeah, that, that, that's a good, uh, good point. So, so I always have the question is, you know, because lithium metal is a deposition stripping process. And can we fully utilize the past SEI you already built, not growing the new SEI? Because there's no uh, strong evidence saying lithium metal will play it back absolutely under the, uh, the initial SEI already formed. Maybe the initial SEI already formed having some function right there. How do we um, promote this? Uh, process of uh, utilizing, just like graphite, right? Graphite, once you form SCI on the surface, the SCI got reutilized every time, so to be stable. Uh, and uh, just any thought on that? Maybe this is also a good opportunity, G, if G is still online, let's bring back uh, G Lee <laughs> um, into the uh, discussion as well of uh, G is showing uh, certainly more on the solid state. Uh, but I think that uh, I call that as a host structure, having a host right there. Uh, if the lithium can grow into the host, um, you know, uh, you can reutilize the, uh, the SCI already formed. So it will be good, uh, Jason, to see your and uh, also G's uh, uh, input on this. Yeah. Uh, what proposed by uh, Professor Shirley Meng, that you ideally we get this kind of the uh, column structure, when we uh, strip lithium, all the lithium will be uh, removed, and uh, uh, but SELR will not damage. That's the ideal situation. Uh, but physically, it's uh, very hard to realize. In the case of graphite, they have this graphite, uh, SELR form on the surface of graphite. Uh, so graphite itself can be hold the stability of uh, uh, SELR. In the case of uh, uh, pure lithium metal, there's nothing to withhold the, this kind of the mechanical strength. So ideally, we have to find uh, uh, a kind of the structure similar to graphite. If we we'll, this kind of structure can be withhold by a, a physical principles, uh, similar like uh, uh, this kind of the uh, self-healing mechanism without physical uh, frame. That will be the idea. Julie, uh, Julie uh, Professor. You, uh, you have any comments? I, I completely agree uh, with, with, with what Jason said. Uh, there was some recent uh, cryo TM study from uh, uh, my collaborator Mengu, and uh, he showed that uh, for a few cycles at least, uh, indeed you can reuse the old SCI shell. In fact, when you uh, strip, there is this collapse of the SCI shell, but then when you redeposit, there is actually a complete wetting. There are almost like a two-dimensional lithium metal sheet that refills. Uh, the old SCI, at least for a few cycles. But you cannot exceed the previous uh, capacity for that chamber. And I think a very important aspect is also, maybe we should not just think of one, uh, one cell, uh, uh, Jason showed. Uh, I think we should think about uh, a framework structure uh, where you have multiple shells uh, mechanically reinforcing each other. And indeed, uh, uh, the liquid electrolyte has, uh, shown very interesting mechanics and that is very important also, I think, for the solid state battery design. Yeah, um, if I think about combining today's your two talks, certainly will you know, feel free to come back and jump in as well. Uh, as you are having this uh, uh, mixed ion, electron ion conductor right there. And, uh, and Jason is having this electrolyte 
if this could be combined, uh, this mixed ion conductor right there, you have lithium going into this shell. Uh, I also have liquid electrolyte. Uh, sounds like this could be an interesting opportunity <laughs> to address the, uh, the problem of lithium metal. And the lithium metal is the deposit inside. Outside is this uh, mixed ion conductor, electron conductor. So that position happened inside, but outside could be stable facing liquid electrolyte. That could be uh, a possible route to address this problem. Yeah, I think in fact, uh, you and uh, also uh, Professor Hongli have basically been developing similar to a semi-solid uh, battery to control this metal. I think uh, th there might be a, a very good uh, uh, sort of uh, common science in, in all of these. And, and I think uh, liquids are very good for maintaining contact uh, without any stack pressure. Solid have some problem doing that. Uh, and I think uh, this issue of, of tension uh, in lithium metal and uh, cavitation crumbling of the uh, whatever is containing the lithium metal, and, and there is almost like a fatigue issue going on in these structures. So these are all related issues. Yeah. So I ask one more question. Maybe uh, will you you feel free to ask others. Um, this is more for Jason, but G, feel free to also uh, 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 share your thoughts as well. Uh, you have done some work in this area. I mean, looking at the whole electrolyte space, um, over the years, there's uh, many exciting comps that are coming in. You know, if I look at, uh, Jason, you talk about low, uh, localized high concentration electrolyte. This purely high concentration electrolyte, right? They're not localized one, right? And, um, there's also new type of fluorine uh, contain electrolyte to make the SCI more stable, chromic efficiency higher. Um, and uh, what's your thought and compare all these ideas? You know, I mean, you can go to high concentration to the extreme, it becomes a uh, solvent and salt, right? What Chen Sen uh, has, uh, has published in a number of papers on, on that. Uh, and then what other new concepts might be coming in? Um, uh, Jason and G. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, all kind of uh, uh, new electrolyte development recently in recent years uh, for to stabilize this metal anode uh, has a common point, no matter what you call. Uh, you can have a different name, but the common point is uh, uh, they will form a uh, lithium fluoride or lithium uh, and uh, lithium oxide, this kind of inorganic rich ICL air. That, that's the common point. You can have a, a different formula, but most time uh, it's a uh, lithium fluoride rich or and uh, lithium oxide rich. So in order for us uh, ICL air to be uh, this fluoride rich, it had to be highly fluidated. I think that's a uh, one common point. So Jason, is that lithium fluoride rich or is N iron rich? I'm I'm thinking because the lithium fluoride rich might be still debatable, uh, in uh, in several electrolyte system, because uh, a lot of XPS study, you know, looking at the global scale of uh, composition, not necessarily having lithium fluoride in the immediate SCI layer. This is what we find out using cryo EM, but it looks like a good electrolyte having a common, more common, you know, feature is there's a N iron rich SCI and a less a solvent decomposition compound in the SEI layer. Is that fair statement? Yes, I think uh, uh, more accurately we can see uh, your organic species uh, rich. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, from application point of view, uh, this depends on we're talking about cell phone battery or automotive battery. I think a lot of the uh, liquid electrolytes are already good enough if you just want to have a lithium metal battery for a few hundred cycles. But for automotive, you need uh, thousands of cycles. And uh, I think there is still uh, more, more development that, that's needed and new ideas.
Okay, uh, Will, do you have questions? Sure. Uh, thank you, E. I, I thought <clears throat> since we're coming to the end of the seminar, I would ask a provocative question. Uh, as I hear about all these new approaches uh, for the next gen um, lithium based batteries, I can't help to think about the industrialization challenges and bottlenecks as you try to implement this at an extremely large scale. Uh, and the two things I'm thinking about, of course, is the cost of manufacturing and the variability of manufacturing. And the two of you actually have presented a very different approach along that um, axis of something close to being a drop-in uh, electrolyte and something that requires um, a, a new manufacturing method. So I, I'm, I'm curious in designing and road mapping your research, how do you think about the industrialization aspect uh, and how does that um, set your research agenda? So this is a high level question. I think many of our industrial colleagues would be very interested to know how you make those decisions in your, in your groups. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think uh, the liquid electrolyte, because it's a dropping solution, uh, I guess the important thing is, is, is bulk cost. So uh, reducing the cost to acceptance level is, is very important. So the localized high concentration electrolyte, that's a, that's a great idea. And uh, you know you also need things like flammability, uh, viscosity, you know, wetting of the electrodes. So I think to you know mitigate environmental uh, sort of uh, carbon reduction, these are the workhorse technologies we need in the next ten years. The the solid state battery, I think there are many manufacturing challenges. For example, the the stack pressure. I think it's to me very difficult uh, maybe to to achieve in a, in a cost efficient fashion in, in actual large format batteries. And so I think for solid state battery to come in and you know, to be having a real impact on, on, on climate change, uh, I, I think uh, uh, it, it probably wouldn't happen within uh, 10, 15, even 20 years. And, and this is more uh, what I call a type B or like a baby technology kind of uh, research. So I think, uh, the, the liquid electrolyte work would have immediate industrial impact. Thanks, Ju. Fortunately, I think the problem is much longer term than this. So plenty need for both A and B solutions. Jason? Uh, I have one comment about the uh, lithium metal anode. Uh, in Chinese uh, uh, martial art, they said that the best skill is not skill. And uh, I think uh, in the uh, field of uh, lithium metal batteries, the best lithium anode is not lithium anode. Uh, in practice, you mentioned that the manufacturer uh, ability. Um, as you know, the lithium metal itself from material point of view is not too expensive. Uh, however, the, to make very thin lithium foil is expensive. And especially if we want to make the lithium foil to less than uh, 50 uh, micrometer or even 20, 10 micrometer. Uh, the thinner, <laughs> ideally we use less uh, uh, lithium, but in fact, the much thinner um, lithium is not less expensive, it's much more expensive. Uh, on the other hand, um, there are also, uh, we need a dry room to handle this metal. So ideally, if we can uh, have a very high cooling efficiency of this uh, cycle, and uh, we can uh, minimize the loss from all component, and we can use uh, the configuration of uh, uh, anode free lithium battery. But in practice, this may not be realized. Uh, we still need, we, uh, for at least in the foreseeable future, um, this metal battery is still more practical than anode free battery. But in the search, in the exploration of uh, anode free battery, uh, it can further improve the cooling efficiency and all the component and can help to uh, improve the production of this metal, this metal battery. Terrific. On those very forward-looking notes, uh, I think we can go ahead and conclude today's seminar. 
uh, Ju and Jason, thank you very much uh, for participating today and E for co-hosting, of course. So Kaylee, if I can have the final slides. Um, so we have a couple uh, exciting seminars coming um, in the coming weeks. On November 5th, we're gonna have a thermal storage panel uh, featuring um, industry experts uh, and, and academic experts. And on November 19th, we're gonna have a special session on battery circular economy uh, featuring uh, colleagues from Northvolt and BSF. So I hope you will um, uh, register for these events as well. So on that note, oh, and uh, don't forget uh, to connect with us and uh, so you can stay up to date on the latest progress at uh, Stanford Storage X. And uh, thank you very much for tuning in today and hope to see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jason.